Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to the finale of the FSMB Summer Educational Series, Looking Back, Moving Forward, DEI Stories Touching Medical Regulation. My name is David Johnson, the Chief Assessment Officer at the Federation of State Medical Boards and your host for this series. I am so pleased that we have this panel joining us for today's finale. We have with us today uh, Mr. Paul Lombardo, uh, PhD and JD, professor at Georgia State University's School of Law. Kelly O'Donnell, PhD, medical historian and lecturer from Yale University. And Dr. Baron Lerner, a bioethicist at the Division of Medical Ethics at New York University's Grossman School of Medicine. Each of our panelists has been invited to prepare some brief remarks, seven to 10 minutes, on some aspect of the history of medicine that they believe is important and relevant to medical regulators. And so I would encourage you as you listen today to remember to keep in mind the live Q&A feature that we have you can pose questions or comments in that live Q&A field, and we will have ample time for a conversation, including questions afterwards. So with that, uh, Professor Lombardo, I believe you are leading things off for us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dave. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna talk about eugenics uh, and, and to a certain extent about its relevance to the practice of medicine. Um, if you look at what was done in the name of eugenics over the 20th century, you can identify every group that was traditionally considered marginal. Uh, you can look at how eugenic laws were used to medicalize social problems and subsequently enforce that, that marginalization, that exclusion among those groups. And the thrust of these efforts landed most directly in policies um, that, that gave the government control over reproduction and implicate, implicated the use of medical power by the state. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to explain the ways that eugenic ideas made their way into law. But first thing I have to say, of course, is what is this thing, eugenics? And the, the answer, of course, is, well, it's this word which means uh, well-born. It's actually more than just the word, though. Uh, the word's important, uh, coined by uh, Francis Galton here in 1883. Uh, and saying that it's the study of agencies under social control that improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations. But I think it's important for us to remember that eugenics is also not just a word, but it's a, it's a, uh, a set of ideas, a rhetorical strategy, a body of law. And also, um, it's a group of organizations which we tend to talk about as a movement. Um, the movement really has to do with people who are. Uh, like-minded who gather together, uh, sometimes uh, in, in organizations supported by philanthropy, um, they're nonprofits, they have staffs, they have budgets, and they have agendas which often reach into advocacy for uh, legislation. The rhetorical strategy they use, again, is focused on policing um, people's bodies and then excluding them from the benefits of social inclusion. And if you'd ask me who I'm talking about, I'm talking about the criminals, the poor, um, people who are uh, sexually unconventional, maybe they're rapists, maybe they're people who engage in same-sex relations or they have illegitimate children or they, they uh, are infected with the sexually transmitted diseases. When I talk about eugenics, I almost always say that it, it boils down to two things, sex and money. Uh, it's the money it takes to control and pay for social problems from crime to disease to poverty. Um, and it's focused on people who generate children um, who are thought to carry the seeds of those problems in their heredity. Uh, so eugenics ultimately means let's have more healthy babies and let's have fewer babies and end up um, in the prisons and the hospitals and the asylums on the welfare rolls. The popularity of eugenics is really hard to um, hard to exaggerate. And here are pictures of the first six presidents in the 20th centuries, each of whom has a connection to eugenics. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, popularizes a phrase called race suicide, uh, in which he warns of uh, concerns about uh, people coming into America 
uh, who don't look like the people who are already there, swarthy Europeans. Um, he's very much in favor of sterilization, on racial restrictions on immigration, uh, and similar, and, and, and really the concern about replacement of white Anglo-Saxons with other people. Uh, Taft is um, very popular within the eugenics movement, um, but he's known most really for his, his work as chief justice after he became president uh, in uh, assigning a famous Supreme Court opinion to Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. in the case of Buck versus Bell, which, which uh, prohibits, uh, uh, well, which allows states to prohibit uh, childbirth by surgery among uh, people who are, who are decided to be socially inadequate or somehow defective. Taft supports that movement and votes in favor uh, of that law. Woodrow Wilson signs a similar law, a sterilization law in New Jersey while he's governor there. Um, Harding is very much uh, caught up with the movement towards forbidding interracial marriage and also immigration restriction. Coolidge signs the Immigration Restriction Act of 1924 after having told his uh, uh, audience in a, a magazine article that uh, Nordics do better in America and all those other people should be kept out. America should remain American. And then finally, Hoover, who has a very tangible connection to eugenics as a, a member and a sponsor of the 1921 um, uh, International Congress of Eugenics in uh, New York. Um, the propaganda that came out of the eugenics movement looks something like this. Um, it was really focused on both positive and uh, negative eugenics. At the bottom, you see every second, 16 seconds a person is born. Um, most the light the, when the light flashes every seven and a half minutes, a high grade person is born. But at the top, we're told what we should be afraid of: people who are born to be a burden. Every sixteen seconds, a hundred dollars goes to people with bad heredity. These are the insane, the feeble-minded, the criminal, and other defectives. Uh, and those same people, which I recited earlier, um, people who have syphilis, people who uh, are unchaste, people who are rapists, etc. So the legal impact of eugenics is its most um, significant mark in American culture. Um, and I'm not gonna uh, recite all these laws. There are, these are six major categories that are passed in the name of eugenics. These are only the categories. There were hundreds of laws. Um, I wanna think about these in order, keeping in mind that fully four of them are attempts to uh, directly control reproduction among unfavored groups. And the other two also speak to the issue, but less, less directly. So we go at the top, the marriage restriction laws, beginning with Connecticut in 19, excuse me, in, in uh, 1895, a law that would have prohibited, um, uh, would have prohibited people from getting married if either of them had epilepsy or other uh, medical conditions. Those laws were in effect in, in many states well and through the 20th century. The other eugenic marriage laws called this in every forum and certainly in newspapers for years and years, uh, were laws that we know as the, the ones that, that required uh, uh, testing for STDs, the Wasserman test, before you got a marriage license. Those laws began uh, roughly with Wisconsin in 1910, and the last ones were repealed around uh, uh, 2008. The racial integrity laws, uh, so-called in states like Virginia, were, um, were on the books for, from colonial era, but they were revitalized in the 1920s with new new language from the eugenics movement, which prohibited people of different races from being married. Um, the law that was passed in 1924 in Virginia was finally struck down in 1967 with all remaining laws, there were 16 at that time, that prohibited interracial marriage in a case called Loving versus Virginia. Immigration restriction law was in place for better than 40 years in America. I've already talked about Coolidge um, and it, focused primarily on bringing more people in, in from uh, the north of Europe, um, from England or from Scandinavia or from Germany, and, and almost slamming the door on people from southern and eastern Europe, focusing specifically on Italians uh, from the Mediterranean basin and Jews from uh, eastern Europe. That law was finally repealed in 1965. Prohibition is a, is a piece of uh, law that most people don't connect to eugenics, but um, I've gone to no less than uh, William Jennings Bryan um, to find him saying that he gives credit to the Women's Christian Temperance Union for teaching school children about eugenics. 
We're teaching school children that alcohol uh, will drive men mad, will force them to beat their children and their wives, will take them into dens of iniquity where they will catch diseases that they will take back home. And the result of all this is family dissolution. It's, uh, it's diseases of childhood, it's infant mortality and the like. And so eugenics and prohibition are very much connected. Uh, better babies means no alcohol to Williams, Jennings, Bryan. The eugenical sterilization laws may be the laws that you've heard the most about. They've gotten the most attention. The first one was passed in 1907 in uh, Indiana. The second, uh, the, the rest uh, came along after that, uh, all the way up to 1937 in Georgia, which was the, the last statute that was passed. Those were finally repealed only as recently as 2008, after some 60,000 people had been sterilized in America. So eugenics was a uh, a movement that yielded a great deal of law that was extraordinarily popular, that was uh, certainly supported by people on both or all sides of the political spectrum, plenty of Republicans, plenty of Democrats. If you count the laws, they break out, by, sponsors break out um, something like 19 Republicans, something like 12 or 13 Democrats. So there's not a whole lot of difference there. And then one of the more interesting things is that at least 12 of those laws are sponsored by people who are physicians, who are members of state legislators. So I'll, I'll, I'll draw a, a line under that and, and just uh, repeat that um, eugenics gives us a lot of area to study in which we try to medicalize social problems. And the result was law, which we are now still trying to understand and in some cases trying to repudiate. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Lombardo. That, that's fascinating because certain things you said immediately sort of resonate in the popular and the political conscious today, replacement theory, Loving versus Virginia, all relevant back in the news. Uh, Professor O'Donnell, I think it's your turn. You have some uh, thoughts you're going to share with us next. I do, and thank you again for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of this uh, and to, to speak to you all today. Um, I, I wasn't sure if we were supposed to give our little remarks uh, a title or not, but I did. Um, and that is because the last time that um, Dr. Lerner enlisted me to, to give uh, one of these sorts of talks, um, I um, boldly called my talk, How to Liberate Yourself from Your Gynecologist which I want to be clear is a quote <laughs> from a source that I'll be talking about um, and not uh, something that I'm advocating. Um, this was a talk to a medical school, to a group of clinicians. So you, you can imagine um, the kind of um, tone that I had accidentally set uh, for myself um, in um, naming that talk. So this is my attempt to correct it. So I want to talk to um, you today about um, some of the histories that I work on. Um, I'm a historian of reproduction, but also of patient advocacy. So I've done a lot of work specifically on the women's health movement uh, in the U.S. in the 1970s. So um, let me advance my slide. Um, uh, if you've heard of the women's health movement or are familiar with this history at all, you're probably uh, familiar um, with it um, through um, the book up there on the left, um, the um, very, very popular uh, guidebook, Our Bodies, Ourselves, a book by and for women. They're there holding that uh, Women Unite sign um, on the book cover. Um, and, and that's because the women's health movement is a sort of a, a sub-movement, if you will, uh, that emerges from the broader women's liberation movement at the time in the late 60s. So essentially, um, to sum it up uh, very briefly, it's a, a feminist kind of inflected uh, consumer rights uh, movement um, about healthcare and specifically a uh, feminist critique of healthcare uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and they're talking a lot about both patients' rights and women's rights, specifically bringing that together um, to advance um, really a critique of what they saw as the sexism of the uh, established uh, establishment medical profession at the time in particular obstetrics and gynecology, uh, and um, advancing this critique of medical paternalism, um, which they really relentlessly called out at every possible turn. Um, 
uh, our bodies ourselves um, used the phrase people, not patients, um, to indicate the kind of um, dynamic that they um, were hoping for um, rather than the one that they were experiencing with their doctors. Um, so the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, actually, um, the authors of that book um, first emerged from uh, a, a doctor's group at a women's liberation conference where they were trying to swap recommendations and referrals and critiques of various practitioners they'd encountered um, and, and came up with um, some pretty dissatisfying answers about their own experiences with uh, physicians. Um, so some other um, things that came out of the women's health movement um, included um, the encouragement of self-knowledge, um, body knowledge, um, the classic cervical self-exam you see up there, uh, that second image, a uh, woman holding a hand mirror and a speculum, right? So this is uh, the, the moment of going to a feminist bookstore or uh, some kind of consciousness raising group um, and discovering actually what um, your body looked like and was doing and becoming familiar with that information yourself um, rather than medical knowledge about yourself being gate kept from you as they saw um, the dynamic as being at the time. Uh, so a lot of um, critique, but also pushes for um, change, um, including um, uh, robust kind of regulatory um, things that I don't have time to get into regarding pharmaceuticals and drugs and devices, um, uh, increased admission of women into medical school, um, and generally a reduction in the amount of um, what they saw as discrimination uh, and lack of respect uh, by physicians to their women patients. So uh, fundamentally what they were calling for was um, a reconfiguration of the doctor-patient relationship um, to be one of more equal partnership um, and more of a kind of um, respectful um, give and take exchange rather than um, some of the negative experiences that they had had with their doctors, specifically around gynecology and obstetric, um, um, both in kind of the general women's health sense and in the childbirth sense. Um, so that's the women's health movement um, generally. Um, in my work, I've looked specifically at uh, the career of one figure in that movement, uh, Barbara Seaman, who's there in those pictures, um, both of them actually, one holding a cervical cap and one um, holding a speculum at a uh, women's health uh, meetup uh, at some point in the 70s in New York City where she lived. Um, she was a journalist. Uh, so. I saw her as um, doing some interesting work um, with the media and as a writer and circulating some of these ideas of the movement. Go forward again. So um, I just wanna spend a, the rest of my time kind of going into the specific example of Barbara Seaman's advocacy and kind of what that tells us about the doctor-patient relationship and this critique of medical sexism and medical journalism. So, there on the right, you see a New York Times advertisement uh, from 1969. Uh, this is for Siemens' book, The Doctor's Case Against the Pill, which put her on the map um, uh, as a journalist um, and um, gained her a bit of notoriety. I'll also note um, that even though this ad says that uh, the pill can cripple and kill, um, what they're talking about in the 60s is the kind of first generation um, Enavid uh, kind of generation of uh, combined oral contraceptives, which did have much higher dosages of um, hormones than modern versions do today. Uh, but basically, she was an investigative reporter, a freelance journalist, uh, and she kept hearing these alarming reports about all these side effects ranging from mild to kind of frightening um, that her um, readers and um, friends and friends of friends would uh, report having while um, on the pill, which was um, only um, approved by the FDA in um, 1960. Um, so it was a new technology. Um, but she, after hearing uh, all these alarming reports about side effects, decided to um, do a, a bit deeper of a dive, resulting in this book, The Doctor's Case Against the Pill. Um, you could say it's a, you know, a medical expose, um, looking at all this side effect literature 
which was, uh, I will point out, unsettled science at the time, um, and reporting it to uh, the masses. Um, but she saw her role as um, being as a science writer and a journalist. The um, thing about the pill, though, that she found more alarming, even than the potential for side effects, was the fact that women weren't being told about the potential for these side effects by their doctor, or at least not in any kind of consistent or meaningful way. And at the time, um, doctors were the only ones kind of having access to this information. So she said that this was buried in medical journals and doctors weren't sharing this um, and informing their patients. Um, one of the quotes in the book basically says, the act of swallowing the pill is an act of uninformed consent. If women are not told, for example, about the fact that they could experience significant headaches or migraines or blood clots and so forth. Um, so some other things um, in the book are super interesting, but I want to focus on um, what she's saying here about the role of the physician in relaying information and how they should kind of um, treat their patient. Um, in a kind of respectful manner. So um, at one point in the book, um, there's a chapter called um, How Pill Doctors Treat Their Patients, I think it's called. Um, and these quotes are from that part. Um, so she's here modeling a bad example of bedside manner and then what she considers a good example. So on the left there, there's this long exchange uh, between semen and a uh, doctor she's interviewing. Uh, she says, which risks do you mention to the patients? Oh, usually the blood clotting disorders and not much else. They wouldn't understand anything else. We scare the heck out of them. We're to tell her, we tell her that in case of anything abnormal, she should call. You don't have to outline it for them and make trouble. You don't have to plant seeds about what they're going to call them about. If you tell them the symptoms, we'll have them by the next day. So this is presented as the ultimate kind of bad example <laughs> of what doctors are doing when they're prescribing the pill. They're not even um, letting patients know what to look out for in the event that um, they have um, any kind of adverse reactions, except in very particular cases. On the other hand, you have this example presented by Seaman of what looks like good practice and good bedside manner. So the physician's taking down his PDR, showing them the list of complications and dangers at the moment kind of of deciding what contraceptives they're going to use. The doctor translates the medical terms for them. He answers their questions. So this is, this is presented as a, a good example of a doctor. Stephen then goes on um, to um, get more involved with the women's movement and the women's health movement. Um, and there's an increasing sharpness, I think, to her critiques of this type of behavior. And you can see that um, in going into the 70s a little deeper. So uh, dear injurious physician, uh, do gynecologists exploit their patients, bringing medicine to heal? These are popular press articles where she's kind of extending this critique um, saying, hey, gynecologists are not treating their patients with respect and we need to call them out for it. Um, incidentally, um, she's also involved in some of the um, debate with Congress and the FDA about um, drug labeling, which I'm happy to get into um, in the Q&A, which is a way to kind of subvert this um, reliance on physicians to share information. Um, so by the time Seaman writes her second book, uh, Free and Female, which is a book about sexuality in general, um, she, she dedicates an entire chapter <laughs> to gynecologists kind of not doing their job correctly. And this is where I get my title from, How to Liberate Yourself from Your Gynecologist. So um, she goes through this chapter just with example after example of all of these incidents she's collected um, from her readers, from her friends, uh, from people in women's lib groups, uh, from research she's done about um, gynecologists uh, making sexist jokes to or about their patients performing unnecessary hysterectomies, prescribing them drugs that are clearly contraindicated uh, without informing the patients, right? Um, but I wanted to end on a more positive note um, than, um, than that, um, a note that implicit within these critiques is kind of a sense of hope um, that the relationship between 
doctors and patients could be improved. So if you look at the um, quotes that I've pulled from that chapter, it's not totally bleak critique. Um, she does suggest um, that gynecologists can change, doctors can change if women are insisting on um, being treated as full partners in their own health. Um, patients uh, can kind of demand to be taken seriously by their physicians. And on my, uh, this is my final slide, um, I wanted to show that this was a critique that I think the profession was uh, receptive to at the time um, and was not um, as radical as a phrase like liberate yourself from your gynecologist suggest. Um, so this is a, a debate that was republished in Today's Health, so the publication of the AMA, the popular one, um, where Barbara Seaman is talking to a New York City gynecologist about some of these issues. And she says um, that, you know, even as little as five years ago, women didn't think they had the right to speak up and, you know, basically be heard um, by their doctors, but they're seeing some change. Um, and the her doctor um, opponent in this uh, quote unquote debate says, yeah, yeah, I wish some of them would change even faster because women shouldn't be kept in the dark about themselves. Um, it's a patient's right to know what's going on and she ought to insist upon knowing. So um, while Seaman was widely criticized by a lot of people for uh, her sometimes inflammatory rhetoric, I wanted to suggest that um, sometimes when we look back at patient advocacy after a period of time um, has elapsed and reforms and changes have been made and critiques have been taken into consideration, we find that actually maybe what people were asking for all along was um, something super basic that we take for granted today, like, for example, being full partners in your health and being treated with respect by your doctor. So I'll leave it with that. And thank you again for having me. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Well, thank you, Professor O'Donnell. I, I couldn't help but notice a note in a couple of instances, you know, terms like unsettled science and frankly, informed consent issues that uh, resonate today, quite frankly, still in 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Lerner, you are next up and uh, I'd like to hear your talk. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, actually dovetail a little bit on the Professor O'Donnell's talk by uh, starting with a woman who is a peer, uh, a contemporaneous peer of Barbara Seaman, that's Rose Kushner. So I'll tell the OBGYN story a little bit uh, differently with uh, re reference to breast cancer. So in 1974, this woman, Rose Kushner, uh, developed a lump in her uh, breast. And instead of going to a surgeon and having an operation that was called a radical mastectomy, a, an enormously disfiguring operation, um, automatically, regardless of the size and the spread of the breast cancer, she went to the library at the National Institute of Health. She was lived in Bethesda. She was a journalist and discovered something very interesting along the lines of what Barbara Seaman was doing, that there was actually beginning to be a debate in the medical community about how aggressive you had to be as far as an operation went for breast cancer. Maybe you could just remove the breast or even just the, the, the lump. And so Kushner became an activist very similar to Barbara Seaman. Um, and she was very much um, within the second wave feminism movement as well, challenging doctors. The surgeons were extremely dismissive of her as the uh, obstetricians had been with Barbara Seaman, uh, and we get informed consent here as well, thanks to Rose Kushner and the publicity she gave about women understanding their options, speaking up to their doctors uh, in a what was quite remarkable at the time. In 1979, Massachusetts passed a law that actually mandated breast surgeons to tell women with breast cancer all of their options. So this was a seemingly intrusive entrance of the legal profession into medicine, but in this case, serving a good purpose of letting women know their rights. And obviously, uh, 
uh, the, today, things are much, much improved, but that's where Kushner got her start. But I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, and show how the early breast cancer activism has become more complicated since. So it starts out in an oppositional way. Kushner is very much an outsider challenging the medical profession. But at some point, there's only so much you're going to do as an outside actor. And for those of you who know anything about health movements and general public health movements, this is a common pattern where a public health problem is identified. Uh, there's opposition. People in charge need to change things. But at some point, uh, you need to begin to work with people within the movement to get more done than just being oppositional. So I'm going to try to see if I can advance my slide here. My phone keeps going off. Hello, let's go. Rob, you might have to do it for me. But let me try it one other way. Okay, I did it. Uh, so uh, a group that many of you may know, this group started in 1982, so it's about eight years after Kushner's breast cancer, with a very different approach to breast cancer. Um, Non-oppositional doctors working with doctors, trying to fundraise to understand more about breast cancer and its physiology, and uh, embraced uh, corporate ties. Um, and uh, the Coben Foundation was started by this woman, Nancy Brinker, again, to improve research, learn more about the disease. I'll, I'll say more about this organization, but you guys know it as the group that started the Race for the Cure. And obviously, a lot of groups do that now, but they're the ones who really initiated these very public events where money is raised in an optimistic, hopeful manner to try to. Uh, get better control of breast cancer. Um, an interesting rift um, also has developed. Sorry about my phone going on and off. Okay, I think I got the hang of it here. There we go. Whoops. Okay. Uh, so uh, a controversy that some of you probably know uh, has to do with early detection. So uh, the Komen Foundation and other groups that were interested in fundraising, working with corporate America, have adopted a very positive message toward early detection. The American Cancer Society is another group. Let's be aggressive. Let's get all women to get mammograms. Um, indeed, Betty Ford, when she had her breast cancer, also in 1974, was also gave a very optimistic message. If you only get a mammogram, it will save your life. Um, and this has been interesting in the breast cancer world because there are epidemiologists and others who study mammograms who have been less optimistic about what mammograms can accomplish, particularly for younger women. Uh, but you see this interesting rift among people cautioning about side effects and harms of mammograms on the one hand, and then the Omen group and others when, and indeed we'll be in Breast Cancer Awareness Month in four days, you'll see all of these signs uh, urging women to get mammograms regardless of their age. Um, and another legal uh, aspect here, in 1997, a group issued a, what was perceived as a fairly negative recommendation about mammogram screening for women in their 40s. This was NIH. And the Congre U.S. Congress actually vote in Senate voted 98 to nothing to rebuke that. Uh, not that they had power to do that, but they were trying to make sure that MAMGRAM still got funded. Um, and this underscores how this has become a political issue. And they're trying to legally mandate an interaction between doctors and women regarding mammography. I'm going to go to the next slide, hopefully. OK. Uh, a little more about. Uh, some of the race for the cure type event. Um, and maybe some of you have participated in them. Um, I've certainly gone to many of them. Uh, they are very um, upbeat. Uh, they are very pink. Pink has become the uh, color associated with breast cancer activism. It picked up on AIDS activism, which had a red ribbon. Uh, and you get all these pink products. Um, 
women and the Komen Foundation have raised hundreds of millions of dollars for research. And some of it has been translated directly into very impressive advances in the world of breast cancer. So there's a, uh, there's been a big push in this regard uh, to supplement governmental funding with private organizations like this. Uh, Avon, which you see here, has been a major player in um, breast cancer activism uh, and sponsoring these October and other events. But there's been a back. Um, some have argued that breast cancer activism has been co-opted by the ties to industry. And maybe this is really a way for corporate America to pretend they're doing good and have people feel like they're having a good time, but really to make money for themselves. And this argument has been bolstered by the fact that evidently some of the products that are marketed by the companies like Avon and Revlon that do breast cancer awareness may themselves be carcinogenic. So talk about an ironic circle. Cosmetics have uh, contain products called parabens, and you can see them at the bottom of the slide there. Parabens and phthalate um, that are felt to be pro-estrogenic and pro-estrogen is a way to promote breast cancer. So you get this interesting um, argument here in the world of breast cancer where there's a, a fight really between people saying more activism is better, it's good to work with corporate America, research uh, advances are, are crucially important, um, and the groups that are pushing back. Um, last slide is another crit similar criticism that not only says that it's bad to be marketing products that are potentially carcinogenic, but that this is infantilizing to women. So look at these teddy bears and models draped in, I, I better not say anything, just look at the bottom picture, <laughs> and pink ribbons, and uh, that here we are emphasizing attractiveness to men when we should be fighting a disease, and why are women marching and getting teddy bears? And the critic, oh, Barbara Ehrenreich, who recently died actually, has written vociferously about this and said that this was infantilizing to women and puts them in a state of childlike dependency. Um, so I'll finish by just saying that we wind up in the world of breast cancer, as with other social movements, of having a big tent. There are activists who are politically on the left, who are worried about carcinogens, they're worried about why don't we try to prevent breast cancer more? Why don't we clean up the environment? Concerns about the issues of toxic waste and conditions and re relationship to breast cancer. And then you have people on the other side who are less concerned about that and more concerned about getting women into early detection programs, getting them the best treatment, doing top tier research and trying to cure women who have breast cancer. Um, and that's where things sit now. It's sort of a big tent approach um, in, in breast cancer activism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lerner, and thank you, Professors Lombardo and O'Donnell for those, those, those comments you shared with our audience. I'm going to have us jump straight into the Q&A and start with a question that's already come in from the audience. And Professor O'Donnell, this is this question's for you. Uh, this listener writes, well, during the time that Barbara Seaman was writing these articles and books, over 90% of uh, gynecologists were men. And she writes that now over 90% of gynecologists are women. So she's wondering what role did you think uh, Barbara Seaman's uh, activism play? Was she a catalyst in some ways for this kind of demographic shift within this specialty of medicine? Right, that's a great observation. Um, I wouldn't say that she herself was a catalyst specifically. I do think the, the broader women's health movement uh, was very interested in this question of um, the kind of um, deeply, deeply gendered um, 
fracturing within the profession um, and the the limits to women becoming um, particularly certain types of um, specialist positions. Um, I, I will note, though, that um, the the quote of the the bad example of um, bedside manner, where the you know you don't want to plant seeds, you don't want to tell them anything, will you know have basically um, um, fake symptoms. Uh, that was a woman physician. <laughs> that was a woman gynecologist um, <laughs> who um, um, became um, basically a, a nemesis of semen. Um, and and I have been approached uh, a couple times by um, women doctors who sparred with semen very publicly. Right, and and so semen would have argued, I guess, that it, it isn't even necessarily the gender of the practitioner but kind of the internalization of um, these like sexist messages that were floating around in the medical culture, right? And, and some people have written um, about um, how, especially at the time, uh, medical education kind of continued to inculcate these messages of sexism, uh, regardless of who the practitioner uh, was uh, gender-wise. Um, but that is true. The, the, the proportion has like definitely flipped um, and um, I, I think <laughs> that has led to much, much better outcomes um, and much better interaction um, in terms of the, the practice of women's health, for sure. Um, whether we can say that, you know, correlation or causation, um, we, we can never be too sure about that. Um, but I think that is a part of it. Um, there were other folks around um, in this movement as well, who, who were more specifically focused on the treatment of women, uh, medical students, um, the kind of structural barriers to uh, people in that profession and so forth. Thank you. There is another question that's come in from the audience. Uh, this one's uh, for you, uh, Professor Lombardo. Uh, this viewer writes, uh, and asked, do you have more information concerning the role of physicians in the eugenics movement? Uh, and he goes on to amplify his question with, you know, was organized medicine involved in promoting eugenics? Was there a significant movement of physicians who were pushing back on this movement at all? Well, let me, let me touch the last part first. Um, I think from the very beginning, there was always some uh, critique and always some resistance within the scientific community, within the medical community, certainly within various religious communities. But in the long run, um, we passed an awful lot of law in this country. And and I, I just finished a paper, which will probably be coming out later this year, on this last part that I talked about, which is the, the number of physicians who were in state legislatures and actually sponsored eugenic legislation, uh, in this case, sterilization laws unnatural in one sense, because obviously that's a medical procedure and someone with that kind of expertise would carry more weight as an advocate. But there was clearly a great deal of involvement of physicians in the movement. Um, there are lots of explanations for that. One of them is, is simply that this was a time when the country was looking very much for um, credentialed people and expertise. And I'm sure this, this uh, audience knows that with the Flexner Report in 1910 and the increasing professionalization of medicine as something which you had to go to school for. Um, in the past, it had been mostly apprentice driven in the 19th century. So this is, you know, it fits. Um, physicians were experts. They knew about surgery. They knew about new technologies. They understood heredity. And so the development of the, of the field of genetics runs right alongside the field of eugenics. One is a kind of basic science and the other's eugenics was thought of itself as the applied science. And this is something that physicians were very, very much involved in. Uh, if I could, Professor Lombard, I'd like to ask you a follow-up question. Um, you know, what you shared about eugenics in America reminds us that there was certainly a kind of uh, fluidity to what constitutes an acceptable practice of medicine. And I can't help but think of, you know, medical boards today, they will often grapple with something similar in cases dealing with patient harm, where they tend to center upon, was there sort of a deviation from a, the standard of care? And yet what really strikes me is, you know, during this earlier era, it seemed that 
notions of individual harm were just considered, if they were considered at all, they were secondary to these larger concerns of race. So I just wonder if you could reflect a little bit on that, because I sure, I'm sure that uh, for those less familiar with that part of American history, this must seem very striking and uh, very odd to be learning about. Mm -hmm. Well, the two different things to, to look at. The first is uh, the arguments used to get most of the eugenic laws into place uh, were arguments that leaned very hard on the idea of the public health. Um, and so we're talking about governmental action here. Um, the sterilizations were done, uh, were meant to be done by physicians who were government physicians in state facilities. The obviously getting marriage licenses was something that's completely controlled by state law. So this was not about the relationship of individual patients and individual doctors, which required consent for um, any serious uh, intrusion or intervention. Uh, going back all the way to the colonial period, that's not new. Um, doctors knew that there was legal liability if they didn't get consent for some things. But this was taking a groups of people and saying, we're going to, as a matter of law, take away your right to decide what's going to happen to your body. And we're going to give that to the state and the state through its doctors will operate on you or will, or the state through its marriage licenses will uh, uh, prohibit you from, from uh, becoming wed to someone. So I think the public health angle is one thing. I think you're right that the, the notion of civil rights grew during the 20th century. It didn't start out as very robust. And we thought of some people as having fewer rights from the very beginning, people of color, uh, certainly people who were poor, people who didn't have a voice politically. Uh, Dr. Lerner, if I could shift to you for just a moment. You, your talk really illustrates uh, sort of a patient-led grassroots movement in some ways initially, and you, it was very helpful to hear you contextualize some of this, you know, think pink kind of movement we are familiar with today. And it's certainly consistent with the kind of patient advocacy that Professor O'Donnell shared as well. Um, it seems, as you characterize it, it, it flourished and went mainstream, or I think the phrase you used was it was co-opted. Is there a lesson, though, to be learned from this that is applicable, you think, to other health-related issues today that we should probably keep in mind? Well, I think that the history is is useful because so much, uh, so many of these issues follow a similar trajectory. So when I uh, when I was working on the breast cancer book and giving some talks. Uh, one time someone came up after the talk and they were like, there's all these talks on breast cancer. Why can't somebody write a book about lung cancer and give some talks? And and part of it was there was no good story to be told. It, people with lung cancer, unfortunately, died at, at a much higher rate. So there were breast cancer survivors, but not a lot of lung cancer survivors. So what? You know, you've you've got to, to keep a, a health issue in the public eye. You've got to have an optimistic message. Um, I, I think about uh, yeah. Biden. If anybody saw Joe Biden's recent appearance in Boston at the Kennedy Library, talking about the moonshot on cancer, it's the same deal. Um, he he's calling it a moonshot. We got to the moon in 1969, and we can cure cancer just the same. So you get. These very optimistic messages, trying to raise money, trying to raise interest and awareness. But the reality is, cancer is very complicated. And no, we're not going to lower the mortality rate from cancer by 50% in 25 years. That's not true because cancer is way too complicated and it's too many different diseases. Um, but it's a way to get the science in front of people, it's a way to raise money and interest. And, and this is really the trajectory of all these movements. And I think by studying the past ones, you learn both the benefits and the risks of following that model. Well, since you mentioned science writ large, let, let me throw out a question really for all three of you or anyone who would like to respond. You know, whether the subject is eugenics, gynecology, cancer, science that is bad or when it's bad, or maybe it's better to say when it's misapplied, can be incredibly harmful, obviously, to patients. Um, are there 
telltale signs that this when this is happening or that this is happening or is this simply a case where it's only in retrospect retrospect that we're going to see clearly enough what was actually happening well i you know i i, I think that um there's two things for me that are at stake the first is that is what motives are we should we look out for um and if the motive is to in, in the case of the areas that i study if the motive is to simply set groups aside and exclude them from whatever benefits society has to offer then we ought to we ought to be questioning that we ought to be asking why is that why this group why are we uh deciding to write them out of the out of the body politic um and the second part of course has to do with something that people have you know, Henry Beecher said in 1966, people said much earlier, and that is um, medicine is a business. Um, science is a business. Um, everything from devices and, and, uh, and medications uh, to large um, hospital practices, these are things that generate a great deal of money. Um, they necessarily must. They're such a large part of our lives. Um, but sometimes the, the money becomes the driving force and not the motive of care. And uh, I think those are the kinds of questions we have to ask on a daily basis about about technology, about medications and drugs, pharmacies, et cetera, as well as how medicines practice. Um, I, I might just add, I, you know, I think that the ways in which what uh, Professor Lombardo was saying, it, things have now become even more explicit, um, n not to say that these factors weren't involved in the past, but the degree to which science is being openly questioned uh, in, in an era of the internet and an era of, of uh, polarized politics, I think is just remarkable and, and dwarfs in a sense what has gone on in the past. I was listening to a podcast this morning and heard a, what I thought was a useful term. We're having a crisis of epistemology uh, and, and I think that's really true in science where, you know, going back to your question, David, it, it's easier now, I think, to w watch this happen in real time than perhaps it used to be. Those of us who study things historically, I'm not sure how much these issues were being characterized at the time as science versus anti-science. But now it, it's really out there and it's incumbent upon us, uh, those of us who practice medicine now, but also those of us who study the past is to understand why this has happened and to try to point out the factors that have promoted this uh, anti-science bias. And also, and I think Dr. Lerner put it really well uh, just now, um, one of the things that's constantly on my mind when I'm looking at Barbara Seaman's work, um, particularly on the um, side effects of the birth control pill, which is something I'm focusing primarily on for my book project um, is this question of um, the the questioning of science and the politicization of science. Um, because on the one hand, I want to be able to kind of do um, the opposite of um, what, what David suggested, which is to be able to see um, debates about science and scientific knowledge kind of being worked out and settled historically um, without um, raising questions kind of in the present uh, by following that logic down path that like really it shouldn't go down because it's not relevant right so like how do i balance um saying well yes in the 60s we th these were legitimate claims to be asking for more detailed epidemiological data about the risk factors for clotting disorders for uh, contraceptive users right so in the uh successive years you know people figured out all right here's the risk factors you know age smoking so forth like uh, they didn't know that in the moment and it was good from a historical sense that people then went on to create new knowledge to um, kind of specify the risk question. That does not mean <laughs> that you can pluck out a historical example of people talking about side effects to then say, well, therefore, let's deny stuff about the COVID vaccine in 2022, right? 
Um, so it's always a really delicate dance, I think, when you are applying a historical perspective to these questions, um, because you have to kind of make sure you're situating yourself in the context that you're in and understanding the actual specific parameters of the debates that you're talking about, right? I, I'm very wary of making broad claims about science or anti-science um, on a grand scale, because I think that's, that's really ahistorical. Okay. Well, a, a follow-up question. This has come in from the audience. Uh, this person writes uh, very succinctly, how do we get the public trust back and who should be leading this recovery? I think this goes to that sort of questioning of expertise and science that you've alluded to, all of you collectively. Well, I, I think one of the ways you do that is by teaching people what science is. Um, I think we have a, we have a, a, people often believe that science is a bunch of right answers um, and, and that they never, they never change. And that's not true. And the practice of medicine evolves constantly by incorporating new science, but that means you have to be willing to look at and question what you're doing and then come up with a, a better way of doing something. So science is a process. It's not a bunch of answers. And we, and until we communicate that to the public, I think they're going to, there's, there will always be a misunderstanding when things change. I, I would just supplement and say, you know, I think a lot of, uh, I give a lot of talk to science journalists. Um, and I think that, that they're, as people who are sort of conduits between the medical profession and the public, they're, a, they're a good way to, and it's hard. Uh, you know, you're talking about new, such nuance when you're talking about scientific yeah. findings and then something is good and then it's bad and the public be potentially becomes discouraged. But as, as Professor Lombardo was saying, it, you know, it's a process, I think, of education and understanding the, you know, the, the complicated ways in which we understand evidence. Professor O'Donnell, you may get the last word on this if you'd like to weigh in. <laughs> um, I, I think that those were both really well said, and I would add that um, I, I think that both um, historians and um, medical practitioners can and should also weigh in uh, with their perspectives as well, right? We, we have a whole um, constellation of people who I think can be doing important um, medical and science communications work kind of uh, in concert with each other. And I think that's really how you get to um, the, you know, satisfactory nuance that, that is needed to talk about tough questions. Well, we're coming toward the top of the hour. So let me offer one last question that I would like to get a, just a, hopefully a brief response from each of you too, which is what would you like our audience who are today, a lot of medical regulators, members of state medical boards, staff at those state medical boards, what would you like those folks in the audience to take away from the conversation today? The history like life is, is messy and you have to be willing to look at it with a hard eye. Well said. Um, I'll just throw in a term that we haven't used much yet or at all, but which but has a lot of relevance today in, in medical settings that, that is helpful, which is helpful and not professionalism. So, you know, there's a, a lot of the issues we've been talking about today are getting lumped for good and for bad under the rubric of medical professionalism. And it's very complicated. What does professionalism mean? Who gets to say what being a professional is? But uh, I think it's important to interact with that terminology and literature because th there's credence to trying to teach young clinicians and doctors to be good professionals. And that's a way to try to get a lot of these historical lessons uh, impactful. Professor O'Donnell. I just want to second that. that. <laughs> I, I can't think of a better way to say the point that I was going to make, which is essentially that, but said better. So ditto what Dr. Lerner just said. Well, I know that resonates with medical regulators because that is uh, from their disciplinary role. That's certainly one of the issues that they deal with quite frequently. 
Well, I would like to thank all of you who have listened in to our conversation today. And of course, a special thank you to our panelists. I would encourage those of you, if you have a colleague who was interested in today's session, maybe couldn't attend, remember we're going to be posting the recording of this uh, session soon. Thank you again to everyone. I hope you have a great day. So long.